tell Jesus. those hands and open your mouth and worship him. Tell him how much you love him. Oh, we honor you, Jesus. You are worthy. Come on, lift your voices to the King of Kings. Oh, we honor you. Oh, we want to stay in your face. We want to get lost in the gaze of your eyes. We want to stay lost in the warmth of your smile. Oh, great King. We worship you. We worship you. I want to see all the people who have come here from different nations and you flow from overseas. Stand on your feet. Look at this. Tell us where you're from. From Israel. Israel. Jamaica. Jamaica is here. Kenya. Kenya. Portugal. Portugal is here. Wow. Kuwait, Middle East. Kuwait is here. South Korea. South Korea is here. Come on, give South Korea a great big God bless you. Japan. Japan. Come on, give Japan. And all of them are from Japan too. Onichiwa. Onichiwa. <laughs> Indonesia. Indonesia. You're going to take something major back to Indonesia. I'm going to say face to face. I'm in. You're going to take face to face back to Indonesia. Uganda. Uganda. Belgium. Belgium. The Netherlands. The Netherlands. Victoria, Canada. Victoria, Canada. Sydney, Australia. Yeah. I like that lady. Albania. Albania. Oh, Ecuador. Ecuador, yes! Paraguay. From Paraguay. Come on, give Paraguay a great big God bless you. London, England. London, England is in the house. Public of Liberia, Africa. From Liberia. Come on, give Africa a great big God bless you. Estonia. Estonia. New Zealand. New Zealand is in the house. Wow. Now give the Lord a shout of praise. And now let's get started. Hello, everybody. I want you to get your Bibles out. And I want to talk to you about the most basic but most serious thing in pleasing God. I want to get to the root of why you displease God and why you can't please God. If we don't deal with that, then you can't please God. A lot of you are displeasing God because you don't understand why and how, but I'm here to teach you and show you. So we started the teaching so that you can have victory. Now I want you to lift your hands right now and ask the Lord to give you revelation. Ask him to give you understanding. Ask him to clean your heart, break the scales off your eyes, lift your hands, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you anoint these lips of clay that I not merely speak as a man or as David. I pray that you will uh, come upon me and inside of me to teach this as you would have me teach it so that your people can be saved and honored with salvation, number one, so that they can make the rapture translation intimacy is the goal whether it's in the rapture or whether it's before the rapture. God, whether their time is to depart before you come on the clouds or during, I'm preparing them to be wise, five wise versions so that they can make it to meet you, whether it's before you come or after or during, I'm sorry, in the name of Jesus. None of us want to be here doing Antichrist, God. If they missed the rapture, it would be because they wasn't ready. And it won't be because I did not prepare them with the word of God. I pray right now that their ears, scales will fall off their ears, scales will fall off their eyes. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Okay, so I was teaching you about the importance, why people 
disobey God. Why they disobey is simple. Why, why people obey God like David versus Saul and why certain people disobey God. You understand that? You got to understand the difference because everybody will say, well, didn't David disobey God? Yes, he did. But he was not a rebel. He was not rebellious. Saul was a rebellious king. David was an obedient king. That's why at the end of David's life, even after he uh, murdered a man and did a, a very horrible act, God still called him a good king. How do you become a good king in the eyes of God? And please God after doing something wrong because you necessarily you are not what you've done wrong. But how do you determine who you are? How can you really determine because Saul did some wrong, but that's who he was. How do you determine? And I'm here to teach you that as kings, but it is my job as an emperor. That is a high king or over all of the kings on the earth to teach you how to be a good king that pleases God. How to teach you how to be a David and not a Saul. How to determine if you are on the right path in your kingship or not. So we're going to start at Samuel, 1 Samuel, where Saul disobeyed. And that whole passage is very important. And there we will start. So that that passage is First Samuel. And everything we're about to study is very serious, okay? So 15th chapter, 20th verse. To the 23rd verse. So Joseph, stand up and read that. All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgag. Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, verse 24 is very key. Go to verse 24, too. Yes, sir. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You see how I defy anybody? How dare a human being to talk to me with disrespect about what God tells me to say and be afraid of them? The first thing Saul admits, he was afraid of people. You cannot be God's king being afraid of people. If you fear man's voice, then God takes this as a direct rebellion, a direct disrespect to his presence. But listen to what Saul said. I did not obey God and I did not obey you as the prophet because I fear people's voice. God expects people to obey him and the man he sends. Listen, read verse 24 again. Yes, sir. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Be and thy words. You hear that? And thy words. He said, I didn't just transgress the commandment of the Lord. 
You were his sent messenger with those words, and I dishonored your words. And why did he do it? Because he feared the people. So here it is. We see that the fear of man can make you disobey a man of God, can make you disobey God's command through a man of God or God himself. You got to get rid of fear of men. The king of Babylon that wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow to that statue, they were not afraid of men. That's why they could obey God. You cannot obey God fearing people. So we see here, Saul couldn't obey. Number one, he feared the voice of the people more than God. Which means, disobedience means to mishear. It goes exactly, it comes from the Hebrew word to mishear. I want y'all to go and pull that up and start to get that up in a moment. But what it means to mishear, it could be mishearing the right person. He listened to the voice of the people instead of the voice of God. He's mishearing. You can't obey God and you mishearing God. You rather hear people than hear God. Go back to the first scripture. We started in Samuel, and I want, I want to start showing you, breaking down these words in the Hebrew so you can learn. Yes, sir. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Stop right there. He's lying. He's saying he obeyed when he didn't. And he don't start repenting. He don't start repenting for disobeying until Samuel confronts his lie and his disobedience. That ought to tell you something right there. Most people can't please God because they are lying. They are hiding from the truth. They lie to themselves. Oh, I obey God and you know you didn't. God know what you did. It's a false repentance, or it's a false image of oneself out of a lie. He said, I did it, I utterly destroyed, but, but, but. Anybody who have a lot of buts are rebellious. That means excuses. Yes. But the people took up this one. See how he blaming it on them? It's always, I obey God, but this person. But, there is no darn but. Read it. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gil Gilgal. He, look at, listen to that. He make an excuse. He's the king. He's supposed to make sure they obey, all of them obey. But he's going to say, but they did this, and they wanted to sacrifice to God. Now he's going to try to put God in it to make it look like, oh, they wanted to love God with the sacrifice. I I've seen people like this. They're so darn wicked, and instead of really repenting and being honest, they are rather cover up their disobedience and their lies. That's a rebellious person. That's how Saul was. God called him rebellious. Look at his rebellion. I did everything you told me to do, but the people, and you the king over them. But the people took of all the da-da-da spoils, and then, but they wanted to sacrifice to God. That, wasn't that good? He's basically trying to deceive the prophet. Verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Stop there. See that? He couldn't fool Samuel the prophet. Samuel was strong. But I know some prophets who are suckers. They would say, you know what? That was a good, that was a good, that was wisdom. And they know God wanted him to, to destroy everything. But Samuel was a good prophet. He says, wait a minute. Don't be trying to, don't be trying to sully, sully me with they, they, they kept the sacrifices just a sacrifice to God like that was a love thing and they were doing the right thing. Don't bring me that crap. He says, has God delight? Finish reading that scripture. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. 
Now stop there. So now we're going we're gonna to look up the word obey. Let's look up the word obey. If you want to live a life of obedience, this is how it starts. You must go to the Bible and learn what God's words say about obedience. And you start with the, ba the very root meaning of Hebrew words in these scriptures. So now we're going to go to the, 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 um, the word obeying or obey. It's mentioned twice in that scripture. As in obeying the voice of the Lord, to obey is better than sacrifice. So let's look up the word obey and see what it means in the Hebrew. There will be your answer to get to the root of a life of obedience. All right, I want y'all to bring that up on the screen now. Here it is. It comes from the Strong's Hebrew Concordance H8, the Hebrew word that's, that is numbered at 80, 85. Shama is the Hebrew word 80, 85. The same word, you see those letters in Hebrew, that means to obey. And listen to what it says, come from the primitive root to hear, to hear intelligently. Yes, sir, a primitive root to hear intelligently, often with implication of attention, obedience, etc. So basically, the root meaning of obey means to hear intelligently. So watch this. When you do not listen intelligently, you can't obey. It ain't the fact that you are hearing, it's how you hear. Jesus said that, I want to go to that scripture very quickly right now where Jesus says, take heed how you hear. He didn't just say, hear the Lord. He says, take heed how you hear. And now, in order for you to be obedient, you got to learn to hear intelligently. What is the root word of intelligence? Intel, to get enough wisdom and knowledge so that when God talked to you, you understand intelligently what he's telling you to do. The reason why the CIA in our country is so successful at what they do, the acronym of CIA means Central Intelligence Agency. They can catch anybody fast. You want to know why? Because they got enough intelligence. What makes the difference between if you can obey God fast or slow is the level of how intelligently you hear God. It ain't just about hearing God. It's hearing God intelligently. Let me give you a very basic um, example. How many have ever heard sinners, they hear the word of God, but they are arguing, and they're saying, well, but it can mean this, or but it can mean that. They, ha they don't have enough wisdom they don't have enough intelligence or intel or knowledge about the Word of God to even know that they're talking like fools. So what, it, what do it mean to hear intelligently? You cannot be an intelligent hearer if you don't have enough information. So that goes back to studying, researching the Word, knowing what God's Word say, knowing His ways, knowing His heart. So that when He says something, you don't have all of these unintelligent thought processes and reasonings in your mind, and you can't even obey God. Here it is. You're stuck because you're saying, well, it could mean this. It could mean that. You are not. See, that's no intelligence. You, ain't, you can't hear intelligently. You are hearing unintelligently. And now you get stuck. You do nothing. You freeze. Well, God, I don't understand. Unintelligence is when you don't understand. How many times have God gave you a dream, but you didn't hear it intelligently? That's why you need a dream interpreter. They are intelligent in that area. They are excellent in that area. That They are intelligent. They can help you see oh, something that looks weird in a dream and show you God's heart about it. They have the intelligence of God to hear him accurately in dreams. I'll never forget when Joseph even as a, a young person, younger than I was presently, was more intelligent than I in interpreting dreams. Because I never could put together how in the world did he get the interpretation about the baker and the butler and the, and the baker, 
the, 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 you know, he says, you're going to die in three days. You're dreaming you're going to die. And I'm like, that don't look like a death dream for birds to be, be over his head uh, eating bread. That don't, I, if I saw that in the dream, and you know if you did, you wouldn't dare think of death. You think of death if you see a car accident, if God just showed it plainly to you. You think of death if somebody comes to you in a dream and shoots you. And most of the time, those dreams are not really death dreams. It means somebody attacking you with their mouth. So death dreams that it look like somebody's shooting you, the gun is the mouth. It ain't really that a person is going to shoot you. Then there are death dreams like the, the boxer Vernon Forrester had where he got killed physically. That was a, and you can tell the difference. But sometimes when you don't have enough spiritual intelligence, you can't tell the difference. You got to hear intelligently to obey a command from God. So I listened to that and I'm like, how did this boy, and I'm saying boy respectfully to Joseph because the boy was bad. He's bad and he's, he's bad and I'm telling you, he's tough. He's excellent in knowing how to interpret dreams. And at that age, he's tough. And I was older than him at that point and still wasn't getting that revelation. Because my thing is, okay, you told him that, but you hadn't told us how you got that. The Bible leaves those details out. And so because I have a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus, I ask him in person, how did he get that? How did that happen? And then Christ. But I'm telling you, and that's why we got to get a lot of my books out and a lot of the face-to-face -face revelations I have out because there is a lot of stuff missing in the Bible that people can't, even preachers can't teach because it's a gray area. They'll read that Joseph interpreted and it was right, but they don't know how he got there. And how are you going to help dream interpreters interpret dreams if you can't get to the details? And if the details are left out of the Bible, how will you train somebody? So I have face to face is so huge. Me having this face to face relationship with God gives me an advantage to hear details that is left out of the Bible. And then God shows me in other scriptures, this is how this happened. And I can still teach it. And so I was like that. I was like, how did this boy come up with this? How did he get that tough? That's tough. But when I was seeking the Lord, and he visited me face to face. He began to talk to me. And when I ask the Lord's things, sometimes face to face, he don't answer me right away. He'll wait to a right moment and say, you remember when you asked me about this? This is why I'm, I'm answering you. So I asked him face to face, and it's like he didn't say nothing to me immediately. But I was sitting down watching nature in the wildlife channel one day. And the Lord visited me right then. He came in right then. And he says, I've come to answer you what you ask. I didn't answer you initially, but I'm answering you now. He says, you see what you're watching right now? You see, the Lord come and talk to me when I'm putting my toothpaste on my toothbrush. He'll come. Or if I'm brushing my hair, he'll visit me. Or if I'm sitting in front of a, a, a watching wildlife, he'll come just like that. And give me revelation. I'm telling you. I know a lot of y'all think I'll be floating in the air. When he come, nope, 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 no congregation. That ain't how it happened all the time. I know you think I'm super spiritual, but I'm not. <laughs> I know you think God's super spiritual, but he ain't like that. He's come to me at some of the most awkward times when I'm putting my toothpaste on my toothbrush and he'll visit me face to face. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, when he first started doing stuff like that, I'm, I'm sure he, he did that to break the religiousness in me because I wouldn't quite expect the Lord to appear to me when I was putting toothpaste on my toothbrush or brushing my hair in the mirror. I'm serious. It broke that religious spirit in me. So by the time he came to me to tell me about this joke, I was already broken of all religion and I was ready to listen to him. He says, you see this program you're watching. He says, you see how the birds are flying, these vultures are flying over a dead carcass. Or, or how they are following when they see a lion about to kill a buffalo or make a kill. They already know that creature is going to die. They start circling overhead before time. Over that overhead of, the, of that thing. 
to start eating on it. And if they start eating, that means it's already dead. If they over the head, it means that they, are, they know they're about to die. If they're eating, they are already dead. And then he brought back to me, he says, remember the scripture that it says about Daniel and the three uh, Hebrew boys? It says they had all knowledge in science. They studied natural science, b birds and animals. They studied them. He says Joseph studied. He knew animal nature. That's what helped him know that that person was going to die because the birds were over his head and they were eating the bread, which means he going to die. Do you see that? I was like, I started crying. I said, thank you, Jesus. How could we have ever known that? And he said, that's why face to face is important. Because I will intrude into this earthly ram and give you revelation of things that you can't see. It's no way of you knowing these things. No man can teach you because they are ancient truths. He says, although they know vultures fly over people's head before they die, they cannot hear me intelligently because they don't have enough science information and knowledge and know how to uh, how I'm using that in a dream. Am I making sense to any of you here? And believe me, you got to be on an even higher intelligence level to interpret God's dreams. You got to have a high spiritual intelligence level to interpret dreams. I'm telling you, that means you got to be familiar with the natural science of things. God said, go to the ant, thou slugger, consider her ways and be wise. God even tell us to go to animals to study. That's why I love to look at the animal channel. I look at the natural nature channel because that God tells us to go to them and get wisdom. That means God is going to use their wisdom in dreams to us. And if we don't listen, we ain't hearing intelligently. So, you know, I almost started to feel convicted when Jesus appeared in front of me and I'm watching the animal channel. But he confirmed to me that I was doing the right thing. <laughs> See how religiousness, oh, oh, Jesus, I don't want you to. I'm going to turn off this TV so I can hear you. No, the whole reason why he came was because I was watching TV and he wanted me to show me what was on there. But see, oh, a, a holier than thou person be like, oh, you talking about Jesus appearing to you in front of the TV. Did you cut the TV off, brother? Did you take your shoes off in front of his holy presence? Why don't you shut up? <laughs> see, that's the kind of stupidity. Y'all see what I'm talking about? Religion will muddy the waters of your intelligence to hear in hearing God. Write that down. Religion muddies the waters of intelligence of hearing God. If you're going to hear God clearly, plainly, and intelligently, your, your heart got to be like crystal clear waters that is not muddied. It has to be like a blank sheet of paper so that when God speaks to you, you know it's him. A lot of you know God has spoken to you at times where you didn't understand. But there were other times where your heart was a plain blank piece of paper and God spoke to you out of the blue and you knew it was him. Because there was nothing competing with his voice in your spirit. And until your spirit becomes crystal clear, clean, that when God speaks to you, it will be cluttered with a bunch of other junk and you won't hear intelligently. Part of hearing intelligently is having a clear spirit, a clean spirit. Clear out the muddiness of religion. Got to get clean. He says, you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. God had to clean my spirit from religiousness. How many understand what I'm saying? Wave your hands at me. How many want your spirit to be clear when God speaks to you? So that it's, there's a clear transmission and there's no interference, no distractions of even stuff that's inside of you. He appeared to me when I was in front of the, watching the animal channel. I, I almost was like, let me cut this TV off. But see, he just showed me, you see, no, you don't have to cut the TV off. I'm here to tell you what you watched on TV is right. 
then that's when he says, didn't my word say, go to the ant, consider her ways and be wise. And now God has done it with our Caucasian fathers who have done a great job at recording animals, their habitat, and airing it on TV. And all we got to do is turn the freaking button on to obey Proverbs. To go to the ant and to other animals and consider their ways and be wise. Do y'all understand that? So put that scripture back up. Listen to what Jesus says in the New Testament. He talks about how you hear among the parable of all parables. Read what it says, uh, Joe. Yes, sir. Luke, Luke 8 and 18. Yes, sir. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Yeah, read the next scripture. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. Christ is talking about the sower in the seed. That it's about your heart, and it's about how you hear the word and receive it in your heart. That determines if you're going to bring forth fruit. Which means... You can't bring the Father fruit. Jesus says, hearing is my Father glorified that you bring forth much what? Fruit. How are you going to do that if the seed don't go on good ground? Jesus talked about his words or his word coming to your ears or your heart going in good ground. There are three bad grounds and only one good ground. The first ground is those who hear in passing and they don't let it get in their spirit and the birds of the field come and take the seed away. The second group is those who allow the cares of this life. It says, and the lust of other things. Their lust for things, their cares for the, of this life, choke in the thorns and thistles, choke the word out that it is not fruitful. The third group is those who fell on stony ground, and it was a little dirt among the stone, but because there was no depth in that, in that earth or in their heart, those are people who are shallow. They are worldly. They have a little God in them. And when God speaks, it says they receive the word with joy. But when trials, tribulations, and stuff like that come to try the word in them, they fall off and they wither and die and can't bring forth no fruit to perfection. But it says the fourth group is the group that in a good and honest heart, which is in a meek and a humble heart, it says receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Jesus is talking about the counter ground of the heart he has, a meek and humble heart. Meekness helps you to receive the word of God so that it can, in a good and honest heart, so that when the seed hit it, you'll bear much fruit. Some 60, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Okay, read Mark 4 and 13. What is that? And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? See, that, you see what he's saying? If you do not understand the parable of the sower and the seed, the deep revelation of what this means, any other parable that Jesus try to speak with words as seeds to get in your heart is all in vain. If you don't understand this parable of all parables, this is the parable of all parables. Why? Because it's the foundational parable for all parables. It's the parable that tells you how to hear, how to prepare your heart to hear, how to have not the wrong heart and to discern if you're in that category. Are you hard, hard of heart? Jesus said those that fall on stony ground are those who get offended when trials, temptations, tribulations, persecution come. They get offended. They have a hardened heart. They can't bring forth fruit unto perfection. The second is the cares of this life. The second category. I just told you the third category. The second one, Jesus says, are those who care too much about the cares of this life. They're too caught up in their own life, their marriage, relationship, singles, thinking they being all in love, but they ain't focusing on God. God don't put you in love to misfocus on him. Cares of this life, thorns and thistles, 
chokes the word of God out that is not fruitful. Number one is Satan. He's the first, because he's going to come. If that seed don't get in your heart, he's going to steal it from you. How? Distractions. Distractions is an enemy to your soul. God wants you to put yourself in a position where the seed can get inside of you. That's the first level. Just getting the word in you. Because if you don't let the word germinate, remember this. Satan always comes in about 72 hours to steal the word. That's how long it takes for a word, the word to get rooted into you. Three days. 72 hours is germination time. If he can steal the word, you know how birds, they go into the ground, they put their beak in the dirt and get the seed out after, right after you plant. That seed got to stay in the ground three days before it even catches on. It's the same way spiritually. After you hear a word like this, if you don't protect it and meditate on it and germinate, let it germinate inside of you for three days at least, Satan takes it. Well, that's why that, it, it, that explains why people go to church every Sunday. They hear a word from God all the time. But they forget what was preached the second day. Because the distractions, the cares of this life, they go back to work. They don't, they don't meditate on the word. They, they receive it with joy, but they don't, they don't keep it. They lose it too quick. So the first level is the word not getting in you. Satan coming to steal it before it even catch root in you. Number two, selfish desires that are above God's will and his word that it cannot be fruitful in you. Number three, this is the parable of all parables when God is seeding any revelation in you. Why do you think I can preach the word without the, out, out, out any scripts or notes most of the time? Because I learn how to let the word germinate in me. And when it really get in you, and you hide the word in your heart where the devil can't steal it from you, you can quote it. You can, it can come up. The Lord will use it in dreams. I'm telling you. But if you don't even get past that level to where you are so busy on your job or in your life that it can't bring forth fruit to germination, it can't germinate to fruit time, you're losing everything. You're hearing a lot of word and producing little of it. This is the parable of all parables. The third one, as I said, is those that fell on stony ground, those who have a hardened heart. What is a hardened heart? They, they got a little of God in them. They got softness. They got a little dirt. And the, and the word will go in that place. They got a place. They got this little compartment place for God. But then they got, their heart is hardened because they are, they are still um, um, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And that, that's what the Bible says. At least your hearts be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin has hardened them. So when the Bible says when trials, it mentions four things, trials, tribulations, temptations, and persecutions. You got to go through all three of the Gospels to get this revelation I'm giving you. Because all four of those are mentioned in three different places in the same parable. He said, Jesus says, when temptations, trials, then tribulations, that's suffering. What tribulations cause you to suffer. That means you go through pain or, or, uh, Trials, temptations, tribulations, and persecution. You know how people get when they get persecuted. They get offended. By and by, they are offended. It means immediately they are offended. Or over, it's over a period of time. I'm sorry. They, offend, they immediately receive with joy. But over a period of time, they start to get offended from these things. They get trapped in the trap of Satan because they're being tempted, because they're being in trials, or because they're in tribulation, or because they're being persecuted. And the word cannot bring forth fruit unto perfection in their life. What is the scripture above Mark 4 and 13, verse 12? That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. 
lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. All right. So that's what he's saying. So what I'm trying to pull together for you is that if obedience means to hear intelligently, that means it ain't just about hearing, I'm telling you how you must hear, you must hear intelligently. Jesus confirms that revelation of obedience and in the sower of the seed, how you're going to produce fruit is take heed how you hear. You must learn to hear intelligently. How do you hear intelligently? You've got to have enough wisdom and understanding. Intelligence is intel, knowledge, data. You need enough intelligent data to come to an intelligent way of listening. It's amazing because I've seen people who know how to speak intelligently, but they don't know how to listen intelligently. And I've, always, I've also understood that most of the time when people can talk intelligently, it's because they have listened intelligently. But it's very few times I've seen people, they have a gift of gab, they know how to talk, but they don't know how to listen intelligently. Everything you tell them, they get it wrong. Oh, I thought you said this. It's always misunderstood. They mishear everything. So now that I established that, going back to Samuel, if to obey means to hear intelligently, and let me read some of the other meanings. It means to hear, listen to. To hear, perceive by ear is one meaning. Number two, to hear of or concerning. It's always to hear. To hear or have the power to hear. Now, I love that one because the power to hear is the ability to hear. And what is the total process so now in order for you to just even be obedient and to hear intelligently, there is a process for that. What is that process? Number one, write this down because this, right, title this, the process of hearing. The process of hearing intelligently. Number one, you must study, research, meditate on the word of God. But watch this. That's not enough. Because I said that because a lot of you do that, but that's still not hearing intelligently. Let me tell you how to hear it when you're hearing unintelligently. When you just open the Bible and start reading scripture and you are letting the word hit your own carnal, natural mind and you are, you are perceiving things just from reading. Let me show you how I used to go through the process of hearing intelligently. Because it's not as easy. Let me get, go through the process with you of what I used to do. One of the things God used to lead me by his spirit to do is the, I didn't want my heart to have hard ground. I didn't want it to have thorns and thistles or whatever. So I prepared my heart. The Bible says one king in the Old Testament and one of the prophets, it says he prepared his heart to seek God. You must prepare your heart to listen intelligently. And I noticed what God would do. He would get me in praise and worship to where I would become broken. I'll be crying in his presence. Before I ever read his word, to hear his word, I would have to get in God's presence through praise and worship. I would spend time in his presence. And while in his presence, my heart was open to hear God's word in a better way. Do y'all understand that? You cannot listen to God's word in the flesh and think you're going to get anything out of it. you got to be in the spirit. So... I went through, a, I took my life through a process from the beginning when I was 17 years old, and I've done this for 30 years. I would never start reading the scriptures till I knew I was in the spirit, till I knew my carnal mind was dead, uh, that God's presence was around me so that he could help me understand the words that he would tell him. So now I'm doing something so that I can hear intelligently. That has to do with putting my using intelligence to put my spirit in the right place to hear right. Because it's very unintelligent to rush straight into opening the Bible and you are not even in the presence of God. Who's going to teach you? Yourself, your carnal mind? Because that's what you're doing. You're teaching yourself. You're allowing your carnal mind to, to, to create the narrative. And even if you have some spiritual understanding, your carnal mind can take that spiritual understanding and 
and, and, and twist it the wrong way. You need God's presence surrounding you when you're hearing this voice. So that means you got to spend time in God's presence. Then that means being obedient and having an obedient lifestyle means you got to spend time in God's presence. Before you even read the word, your heart got to be in the right place. So that's what that means to hear, to have the power to hear. Some of you don't even have the power to hear God intelligently because you have not put yourself in the right process to hear intelligently. You may hear God, but not intelligently. Jesus says, take heed how you hear. It ain't about hearing. A lot of people get excited. I heard the voice of God. I heard that ain't enough. God spoke to me in a dream. That ain't enough. You must hear intelligently. Your receptive ears got to be intelligent. And I told you one secret. I gave you a secret of how to get intelligent ears supernaturally. 3 a.m. morning prayer. Prayer always precedes hearing. It says in Isaiah, you waketh my ear. He waketh me morning by morning. Or it says he waketh my ear morning by morning. And he gives me the tongue of the learned and the ear of the learned. The ear of the learned is a learned person is an intelligent person, right? They've learned. They study. So God says if you get up at 3 a.m. in the morning, he will give you ears that people have developed over scores of years from spending time in his presence and studying. He'll just give it to you at 3 a.m. in the morning just for getting up. That's one of the rewards of 3 a.m. morning prayer. You need that. How many ever did 3 a.m. morning prayer and you started hearing things on a higher level frequency? That's it. That, that 3 a.m. morning, I'm telling you, and it always happens like around right around 6 or the break in the day, you start hearing. Just revelation is coming so fast. Because you're hearing on an intelligent level. That's the ear of the learn. You got to understand, a lot of people can hear, but they don't know how to intelligently speak. But he gives you two things, the ear of the learn and the tongue of the learn. To know how to speak a word to him in wisdom that is weary. Speak a word in season to him that is weary. But it's using wisdom to know what to say to people. The Bible says wisdom is too high for food. That means wisdom is intelligent. So God gives you wisdom in your ears, and you are able to hear it like a learned person. So if you want to learn to hear intelligently, you got to pay the price for those ears. For spiritual intelligent ears are given to you, or the ear of the learned, in other words, is given to you at 3 a.m. in the morning. Because 3 a.m. in the morning is a visitation from God. And there's always rewards when he visits. He leaves a blessing behind him all the time when he visits. And I've done this awesome study. I have Fourth Watch prayer book coming out very soon. It's very important that my writers get this stuff out. But I've studied all of the blessings you get when the rewards you receive at 3 a.m. in the morning. God will give you a prophetic word, whether it's through a dream or whether it's through a prophet. That's another. It says, I sent my prophets rising up early to them. So one of the early morning blessings you get is somebody may say, I had a dream about you and I saw this and this is the prophetic word in that dream. And you just got a word from a prophet because you or a prophetic word from somebody because you were up early in the morning praying. How many ever had that happen? I have it happen to me all the time because I'm doing 3 a.m. morning prayer. He's always having somebody have a dream to give me a prophetic word or something early in the morning. It's one of the rewards. Now, I list in my face-to-face book the different rewards you get uh, from morning prayer. But in my fourth watch book that I'm having written right now, I'm going to detail everything. I'm detailing everything, all the rewards you get when you wake up. And one of them is the tongue of the learned, and it's this kind of ear you need of intelligence to hear God intelligently so you can be obedient. You got to understand when God tells us to meditate in the word day and night, he means that. That means every day. You got to keep up with God every day. You need intelligence. You need information. You need intel to even understand your dreams, how he's trying to talk to you. You can't even hear him intelligently. He can be giving you dreams, but you don't have the ear of intelligence to understand anything. And then you can't obey. 
That's all obedience means, to hear intelligent. We think it means to sin. No, the root reason why you sin and go off into that stuff is because you don't have the right hearing of intelligence. Now, the question is, can you sin and still know and hear intelligently? Yes. But you don't live a disobedient life. You can disobey, but don't mean you have a disobedient spirit. You develop a disobedient spirit when you don't have a hearing ear of intelligence. When you don't develop a life of seeking God and studying and praying, that's a disobedient spirit. That's the root of a disobedient spirit to God. The root of a... So you may do something disobedient and you may have a heart of listening to God and have a lifestyle of studying and praying and hearing God and going through the right process I ain't talking about the people who don't. And even if you make a mistake, God don't look at your whole heart as that's a disobedient person. No, he look at your heart as an obedient person. Disobedient is when you develop a lifestyle of not hearing intelligent, as opposed from a disobedient act of sin in your life. That's how God looked at David. David did some wrong in his life, something major, but God never looked at his heart as any different. He corrected him for his sin. But see, that's God's integrity and righteousness. He didn't say David is wicked now. No, he did a wicked thing, but he didn't have a wicked heart. And a lot of people, their integrity is about what you do, not who you are, which is false. God don't judge you like that. He judge you by the essence of who you are. Man judge you by what you do outwardly. And that's deception. Because some of the most Beautiful people have done some of the most evil things. And some of the most evil people have done some of the most beautiful things that don't make you right. You need to understand God's integrity, not man's integrity. And now today, especially in America, if you do something wrong, they judge your whole life and your all of your integrity. It hangs on that one thing. And that is unfair and it's unjust and it's wicked. That ain't how God does it. And David killed somebody and God didn't do that to him. So you judge that. Now I know that's hard for a lot of you to accept, but if you're gonna you're gonna roll with God, you're gonna roll with him, or you're gonna go, you're not gonna roll with him at all. You're either gonna make up your mind to do this thing the ancient way, the way he does it in the Bible, his heart. Or you're going you're gonna to agree with the 21st century and your own thinking. But his ways are higher than your ways, and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As far as the heavens is from the earth, so are his ways from your ways and his thoughts from your thoughts. Submit yourself to him. Stop going about to establish your own righteousness and what you think is integrity. And submit yourself to the righteousness of God. All right, so here we go. To obey means to hear with attention or interest. Listen to. How many people have I seen and they ain't showing no interest, they ain't paying attention. That's disobedience. Obedience is to hear with attention. So disobedience is to be unattentive or inattentive like we're going to study in a moment. To understand. That means to hear intelligently. Because intelligent, intelligence is understanding. To hear intelligently means to understand. So to be obedient, you got to have an understanding heart. And that's what Jesus just said, least I heal them, least they, they perceive with their heart and understand and hear with their ears and understand and perceive. That's what it's about. You got to hear with an understanding heart. To hear of judicial cases. That means justice. To hear with a just heart. That's what that means. Judicial cases is justice, judging right. To listen, to give heed. To consent, to agree, to grant requests, to listen to, to yield, to obey, to be obedient, to be heard of voice or sound, to be heard, to be regarded. To cause to hear. Call to hear, summon. That means to cause to hear. So, this process calls you to hear intelligently. So if you do not put yourself in the process, then you're not hearing intelligent. 
to cause to hear, tell, proclaim, utter a sound, a sound to sound a loud musical term. That talk about worship, to make proclamation, summon, to cause to be heard. Shama is Shama is is the name of obedience. Now, if obedience mean that, then let's listen to what disobedience mean. So let's listen to what disobedience mean. So we got a word that means to obey, but now we got disobey. It comes from the root word. Here it is, the Greek word. It comes from Greek G, 3878, the number 3878 in the Greek concordance, not the Hebrew, the Greek. This is the New Testament. Listen to what it means, in attention. In attention. And then you got to look up in attention what in attention means. And I have it titled in my journal here. See how I journal? I journal. It's called The Root of Disobedience. The Root of Disobedience is in attention or a lack of attention. Now, watch this. It don't mean you don't give attention to something, it means you can't, you disobey because you. You, you lack giving enough attention to something. Do that make sense? So this is why people think, well, what did I do wrong? I tried to do right. That ain't enough. You got to give the proper attention it takes for you to be obedient. Stop thinking and, and justifying yourself and making yourself think, oh, I'm okay because I at least tried. That ain't enough. It ain't the attention you give to something. It's the lack thereof. That's what it says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You may have knowledge, but you're being destroyed for a lack of it. It's the same thing. You're being disobedient because of a lack of attention. You are not given enough attention to your walk with God to develop a spirit of obedience to please him. But watch this. It says this lack of attention is caused through distractions. So what is it? Is it your job? Is it a relationship? What is it that's distracting you from giving the right amount of attention for you to be obedient? What is distracting you? Is it TV? What is it? What, dist what takes up more? A distraction is anything that takes up more of your time than God wanted to. A distraction is something that leads your attention away from paying attention to the thing that God wants you to. What is it? You got to identify the distractions in your life. And you got to get to the root of the inattention in your life. Not paying attention enough. You can't say, well, God, I studied your word. That ain't enough. Did you study his word long enough to be obedient, to get enough information? It means the lack of attention means that's what inattention that's what inattention means. So that's why it ain't enough for you to just read the Greek and then you know you don't know what inattention means. Look up inattention and it will give you a deeper meaning of what that's saying. The lack of attention. Then you gotta define what the lack of attention is. It don't mean not paying attention at all. It just means you're not giving enough attention. So what do you do? Do you pray for five or ten minutes and get up off your knees too quick where you don't hear God long enough? That's inattention. You don't stay in his presence long enough until you hear his voice thoroughly to the end of the session. Do you give up, get up, give up too early? Are you impatient? Are you anxious? Are you presumptuous? Jumping ahead, moving quickly? not slowing down long enough. That's inattention. That's ADD. Can't keep your mind on nothing. Long enough to get enough. You're not giving enough attention. Okay, there's another word for disobedience in the Greek. This one does not come from the one above. That's 3876. This comes from 3878. Paracoyo. Greek 3878. It means to 
miss here. To miss here. That's how you disobey because you miss here. It don't mean you're not giving attention to hearing at all. It means you miss un you misunderstand or you mishear everything said to you. That's what makes you disobedient in God's eyes. You don't give enough attention to hear right. You mishear everything. How many of you have ever telling somebody something and they, they misheard everything you said? How did that make you feel? You were trying to tell them something in love and they got the wrong understanding and got offended. That's how God feels every time you live a life like that. That's a disobedient heart to him. That's how he judges disobedience. You can't please God with that kind of heart. I'm giving you the basic roots of how to please God. There's another meaning for this. It means to neglect to hear. Oh, I love that one. Because if you neglect going into God's presence and doing the process I just told you a few minutes ago about spending time in God's presence, staying in there long enough, doing it the right way, and then listening, hearing intelligently, you are neglecting the process to even hear right. So you're neglecting to hear when God pulls you into his presence, but you won't go. When he says, go pray and you will not do it. When he says, go st study my word and you won't do it. And you know, in order to study God's word accurately, you need to be surrounded by his presence first. That's how God looks at disobedience. You got to know the Hebrew meaning, the root meaning. And that's why the root of this disobedient word in the Greek para, which comes from the Greek 3844, which is different, it means near, from beside or in the vicinity of, to be in the proximity with a friend. A friend is close. So what do that mean? The root meaning of all disobedience is because you are not near God, you are not beside him, you are not in the vicinity of him, and you're not in the proximity with him. All of those things are important for you to be obedient. A disobedient person is not near him. It's the opposite of being close or near him. Do that make sense? Wave your hands out there on Zoom if y'all understand what I'm saying. Isn't that powerful? How many of you are learning something? So I read this before, I'm going to read it again. The true root and cause of disobedience is simply being inattentive or having inattention, which is the lack of attention through distractions or being distracted. It don't necessarily mean unattentive, it's inattentive. Unattentive means to be careless and not focused at all. And as a result, mishearing what is said, the true, root, the true root and cause of disobedience is this inattentiveness, which is a lack of attention. And as a result, mishearing what is said because you ain't paying attention or either rejecting or neglecting to hear what you need to hear in order to obey, this lack of how we are hearing or neglecting to hear is all a result of not being near the Lord or in the vicinity or proximity of his presence, being close to him like a friend. The lack of being in God's presence or near him or abiding in him and near close to him through being his friend or his praise and prayer partner causes the result of disobedience. Disobedience is all the result of a lack of hearing God from not staying close to him in his presence or doing the thing or the process it takes to hear him intelligently. Those, those things would include spending time in his presence, standing in God's counsel, as he said in Jeremiah 23 and 22. He says, then when you cause my people to hear my words, but because you can't hear God's words by standing in his presence long enough and in this council, you give wrong words. 
studying to show yourself approved to God. Praise and prayer partnering with God. Number three. Four is hearing or intaking God's voice through listening to him through others. Rhema word, listening to the preach, preach word every day. So number three was praise and prayer partner with God. Two was studying to show yourself approved. So one more thing. Now, I must teach you the difference between disobedience and rebellion. Because when God rebukes Saul, and I'm about to let you go now, but when God rebukes Saul, he says, oh, he says obedience is better than sacrifice, and to obey the, and to hearken than the fatness of rams. Okay, Joseph, go back to that scripture. Yes, sir. First uh, Samuel chapter 15 and 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now watch this. He says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It didn't say you're working witchcraft because you're rebellious. He's basically saying whenever you're rebellious, it's the same offense he takes to people who are witches and warlocks or who are doing sin in that way. So you got to understand how wicked rebellion is. And stubbornness is as idolatry and iniquity. And wick iniquity means wickedness or twisted. Idolatry means a healer. And I'm going to tell you what that means. A healer. Idolatry is trying to cover or heal something when you haven't wounded it or opened it up. You know how when a sore has pus in it, it can't heal until you open it up or wound it, and then you patch it up. A lot of people are so passive, they don't want to correct people, and they just want to smooge over stuff. Instead, and God don't do that. It says he will wound, he'll strike you, and then he'll bind you up. He don't bind you and try to heal you. That's idolatry, and there's junk inside of you. He opens up the wound to get the infection out, so it can heal. But idolatry is false healing. You got to look up these words in the Hebrew to know what I'm saying. All right. So bring up rebellion, the word rebellion in the Hebrew in this context. And I'm going to show you what it means. It comes from, it's from the Hebrew number 4784. And look at what it means. Yes, sir. Mir, H4784. Bitterness. That's what rebellion means. Bitterness. This is why you got to study Hebrew words, because Hebrew words tell you the actions of something. It gives an act of what a, a word means. So guess what? Everybody who's rebellious is that way because they're bitter. They get bitter. Now, let me explain to you the difference in disobedience and bitterness. Because all rebellion is disobedience. But not all disobedience is a rebel comes from a rebellious spirit. You can be disobedient because you lack hearing. Your inattention to hear. You miss hearing. But rebellion is greater than disobedience. It's not only you mishearing stuff, you are also bitter. The, what it means is the bitterness causes you to be rebellious. God said Saul was rebellious. He was bitter. And you could tell somebody who's bitter from... Look at how he treated David. He tried to kill David. He was jealous. Satan rebelled because if you read the ancient writings, he was jealous of man, that God had honored man more than he did him. It was always wrapped in jealousy. 
bitterness. Cain slew Abel because he was bitter that God accepted his sacrifice and he didn't accept his. So Cain shows jealousy and he kills his brother. Satan tries to kill Adam and he does because he's bitter and jealous. It says bitter envying. There's a scripture that says bitter. If you have bitter envying in you, so bitterness is connected to envy. All right, we need to go to that scripture real quickly, and let's go to scripture that says, "If you have bitter envying, rejoice not and lie not against the truth." I think it's in James. Put it up. I'm trying to show you how that. If you look, God said Saul was rebellious. The ancient writings have helped me pull this together. Because when I heard in the ancient writings how Satan back, be, got envious over mankind because God allowed him to be a, a, a higher in rank than him, he got envious and bitter and rebelled against God. Cain did the same thing. And so this is the point. If you look at Saul's life, God told him he was rebellious in the beginning. But you see him doing the same thing Satan did when he found out David was chose higher than him to be king. He tried. He, it says a spirit of jealousy hit Saul, and he tried to kill David. David also killed a man. He didn't try to. He did, but it wasn't because of rebellion. It was because of disobedience. He wasn't envious. It wasn't because of rebellion. It was because of iniquity. You got to know the root of your sin. Why you're being disobedient. Are you a rebellious person? Or are you a disobedient person? Or are you an obedient person? Am I making sense? So listen to this scripture, James 3 and 14. Read it, uh, Joseph. What does it say? But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. That's what most people do. They don't tell the truth. Saul could never tell the truth about himself. That's why he was lying but these people. You see that? Bitter envying. Envying and bitterness go together. So let me tell you what God gave me today, and I want you to listen to this or, or about this subject, and we'll move quicker. Are y'all ready? Yes, sir. I said, are you ready? Yes, sir. So listen to this. The root meaning of rebellion in the Hebrew is bitter or bitterness. So if the cause... Or the synonymous meaning of rebellion is bitter or means bitterness, then it means people choose the wrong path to become rebellious because of bitter experiences to them or through the bitter situations and circumstances that are dealt to them in life. Do you not know you really become rebellious because of bitter, the, you choose the route of rebellion? Because of bitter situations and circumstances that happen in your life. You can either become bitter or better. Now watch this. Harshness and a difficult life that creates pain in the heart of human beings cause them to choose to get bitter. And thus this bitterness creates the error in their soul or the error in their soul to become rebellious. We must ask God to turn bitter water sweet. It's by sweetness and kindness we overcome bitterness. It's fo this is how we do it. We do it by focusing on God's goodness or on the goodness of God and not our bitter circumstances or pain from them. And I want all of you to think about the things that have made you bitter, jealous, envying. You got to identify it. That's where your rebellion is. Your rebellion is where your bitter experiences have happened. 
So in order to turn around the rebellion in one's life, it has to be the opposite of embitterment. The revelation is, since bitterness creates rebellion, then it makes sense that only sweetness, which is kindness and goodness, leads men to repent and turn away from rebellion. As the scripture says, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It leads you, it leads you away from rebellion or not to be rebellion, rebellious. If bitterness make you rebellious, then God knows sweetness and kindness with you and gentleness makes you obedient. Well, it don't make you obedient. It turns you from rebellion. It causes you to repent or turn from being rebellious. I'm giving you the solution. We must pull out of life every good and kind thing God has done in our lives and focus on, on that amidst our trials, temptations, and bitter experiences. This is the miraculous that makes bitter water sweet when we think on his goodness and kindness. This will automatically send us into the right spirit of praise. Praise keeps our spirit sweet amidst bitter circumstances. Praise over God's goodness. So we see bitterness promotes a rebellious heart. And this should go in the heart book, by the way as well. Bitterness promotes a rebellious heart in people, but the goodness of God, his tenderness, which is the opposite of harshness or embitterment, leads us to repentance, to turn away from rebellion back on the path of righteousness and obedience to God. The Bible says, lift up the hands which hang down, least any root of bitterness let me just say this. The Bible says, least any root of bitterness springing up and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I want you to go to that scripture in Hebrews 12, where it says, least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. So if bitterness is the root of rebellion, and we're trying to get rid of rebellion out of your life so that you can please God, then we must deal with the root of rebellion. Hebrews 12 and 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. This is how you fall from grace. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A lot of people think, well, I'm not bitter. That happened to me, but I'm not bitter. But that's false. You don't even know what bitterness means. You don't know how to identify your bitterness. How do you identify your bitterness? Is anything, whatever troubles you, one of the signs the Bible gives you in Hebrews 12, when bitterness, a root of bitterness is in you, something troubles you. Like it troubled Cain that God didn't accept this offering, and it troubled him so much he killed his brother. It troubled Lucifer that God honored man more than he did him as an angel. It troubled him where he got envious and rebelled. Your rebellion is the sign that you were troubled by some kind of bitterness. A root of bitterness springs up and it troubles you. That's how you can determine if there's a bitter root. If it troubles you. So listen to this. How do you identify that you have a root of bitterness? Or just bitterness in general? Some people don't know that they are bitter and can't identify it in their lives. They don't understand the cause and patterns of disobedience or rebellion in their life. Identifying bitterness in one's life. New title, identifying bitterness in one's life. The first thing the Bible tells us is that the signs of a root of bitterness is that it will trouble you. There are many things in life that can trouble us in a good way, but in this context of Scripture, it's saying that the root of bitterness troubles us in an unhealthy way and leads to spiritual defilement in our lives against God. Spiritual defilement in our spirit and lives is the cause and effects of a root of bitterness. Don't let bitterness take root in you. Some of the list of things God considers as spiritual defilement, anger, anguish of spirit, anger, spitefulness, all uncleanness. Defilement means uncleanness. All uncleanness forms of net 
which is either forms of natural or spiritual uncleanness. The Bible says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. But the Bible also gives the solution to keep from going down the wrong path of bitterness. It says, lift up the hands which hang down, which means praise. If your hands are hanging down, it means you're in depression. And make straight paths for your feet. Least that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Which healed means the opposite of idolatry. I'm going to get into that in a moment. But depression, when you're depressed, it is a sign of the root of bitterness. All bitterness is, is when you're troubled about something you don't like in an unhealthy way. you troubled about something you shouldn't be troubled about. And it makes you depressed. So people who struggle, if you're in a season you struggle in praising God and there's no joy, you're bitter. You're bitter. You, I'm telling you, that's the sign of bitterness. If you're depressed, you're bitter. Which means you are rebellious. People, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why the joy is connected to grace, charos. That's why it says, least looking diligently as any man fail of the grace or the charis of God, the empowerment of God or the joy of God. Grace is also synonymous with the joy of the Lord, cheerfulness. So when you are troubled, you, that ain't praise. When you are troubled, it's either anguish, anger, or, or something else. So least any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. But you fall from the grace of God when you, there's no joy. And when it's hard for you to have joy, you're depressed. It's a sign of bitterness. That's the sign. Depression is the sign that bitterness is the root of all your depression is bitterness. Because you refuse to be happy. You are unhappy about something you shouldn't be happy about. Let me tell you something. All of us experience disappointments and hurts and pains in life. It's what you do with it. You could become better or bitter. The fact if something don't happen that you want, like for instance, Lucifer wanted to be higher than man. God didn't ordain that. So he couldn't live with that. He got troubled by that. He got bitter by that. Are you that way in any area toward your brother or sister or somebody you think is doing something better or greater than you or achieving something that you are not? You got to deal with that spirit. Listen to this. Praise and lifting up the hands is the remedy and solution to your heart healing from circumstances that seem hard or harsh to you that can affect the heart to go off the right path into bitterness. Some of these circumstances, as, as it is saying in this passage of Scripture, can be direct chastening, can be, uh, can be because of a direct chastening or indirect correction in the form of God's chastening correction and rebukes through the wilderness experiences experiences in our life now in hebrews 12 it starts off talking about the, the correction of the lord and it's talking about people who let their hands hang down and they get depressed because they are corrected by god so they don't deal with correction right and they get bitter that's why people get stiff-necked and more stubborn when they're corrected but the Bible tells us a root of bitterness will spring up in them because they don't take correction right. And that's what happened to Israel in the wilderness. Listen to the rest of this. His chastening, correction, and rebukes through the wilderness experiences in our life. Okay. Or also painful experiences that have created, I mean, also pain and experiences that have created painful memories in your heart and mind. People become very bitter in the process of God's chastening and discipline in their lives, just like the children of Israel did when God used the wilderness to chasten them as he said he was doing. 
And I want y'all to pull that scripture up in, uh, I think it's in Deuteronomy, where God said, you shall consider that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord chastened you by leading you this way through all of this great, terrible wilderness. It also says their heart was hardened over the hardness of the way God led them. In, in Psalms, I want y'all to also pull that way. It says they, they were, uh, because of the hardness of the way, it affected them. That's that scripture. Find that scripture. It's in Psalms. And instead of praising God, they blame God every time. Uh, let me read. And instead of praising God, they blamed God and became bitter over their circumstances and then rebelled against him and Moses, his leader. You want to know why the children of Israel were rebellious and stiff-necked in the wilderness? Because of how they treated the bitter experiences they went through. Do y'all see that? So when you go through bitter experiences and things that cause you pain, you have two routes to take. You can let it make you better. You can let whatever God is trying to accomplish in your life, which is really correction. He's trying to open up something wrong in your spirit and drain it out like pus or infection so that he can come back and heal you up. But if you take the correction wrong, and you get bitter over it, and it troubles you, you allow trouble to start in your spirit over it. You become bitter, then you become rebellious. All rebellious is is synonymous with bitterness. Deuteronomy 8 and 5. There it is. Read it, Joseph, what it says. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy 8 and 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Read six. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Start at verse one and then read down. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse one. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Now, JMMI is on the verge of going into the promised land. These teachings are very important if you're going to stick with us. Go ahead. God showed that in the visitation dream two years ago. We're going into the promised land. Go ahead. What did he say? And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God... All the way. See, he's talking about all the way, the wilderness, the experiences. Go ahead. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled he thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, now you see that? If we are supposed to live by every word that cometh out of the mouth of God, how can we live an obedient life if we are not hearing what he is saying out of his mouth to us? Do you see that? If we are to live by the words that come out of God's mouth, how can we be obedient if we ain't hearing them? So the lack of you putting yourself and you know, the neglect of you putting yourself in the process to hear God's voice, whether it's spending time with God, whether it's listening to Rhema anointed preaching, whatever it is. And this is not only for just getting ancient revelation, but for words that you need for your spiritual growth development. Like what I'm preaching now, this ain't so much ancient revelation, but it's principles and it helps you with your walk. It ain't enough to want to read all the ancient revelations, but you don't have enough foundational word to know how to live and overcome disobedience or anything in your life that's re uh, rebelling or hindering you from getting close to God. Okay, read verse 4. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, 
neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So God called everything that he did to them in the wilderness chastisement. And Hebrews 12 talks about people letting roots of bitterness get into them when chastisement happens in their life. How did, whether it's a chastisement through a wilderness you went through, where you, you went through loss or pain. A lot of people go through bitterness when they go through divorcement. They go through a bitter divorcement. They go through a lot of bitterness with embittered circumstances. You got to discern where your bitterness has come from and where it is. Or else you'll never get rid of rebellion. It says their heart was hardened over the hardness of the way God led them. And instead of praising God, they blamed God and became bitter over their circumstances. And they rebelled against him and Moses, his leader, during their wilderness experience. A lot of you are going through your wilderness experience with God now. And the question is, are the are the hard things or the bitter circumstances that you've gone through, is it affecting you wrongly? Is it causing a root of bitterness to spring up in you and trouble your life and defiling you? Where is your defilement coming from? Some of your uncleanness, some of the things you do that is unclean is because of a, of a defilement from a root of bitterness. Now, if you want the walk of God that's greater than Enoch, which is the walk of Jesus, the Bible says Jesus was an obedient son. He lived a life of obedience to God, and obedience is the key. And that's why we're focusing on this obedience teaching, because this is the key to pleasing God, a life of obedience. And because we were, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and Christ wasn't, then we have to go to the root of all disobedience. Christ could have disobeyed God. We all need healing, as the Bible states in this passage, even if the correction is coming from God. That's why the Bible says that after he corrects or wounds us, that he will bind us up or heal us. The binding means healing. This balance process is needed even when doing surgery or treating a natural wound it has to be closed up and healed or mended back together but stubbornness as in this context on Samuel that Saul had that God referred to which is idolatry that has its meaning in the Hebrew uh, in the Hebrew which means a healer this means Stubborn people try to heal things or mend things without opening up the wound first. In other words, they avoid correction. Anything from God that has no correct, that ha uh, anything from God that has to correct, rebuke, wound, or challenge, that then they then avoid or try to cover without dealing with it. That's the root meaning of stubborn. Yes, yes, Numbers, here it is. Yes, sir, Numbers 21, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For so watch this. Discouragement is depression. They were discouraged because of the way of the wilderness. They got bitter, and because they got bitter because of the and discouragement of the way, I told you depression is, is a root of bitterness. Then they start rebelling against God and against Moses. And God told them this is a rebellious people. That's how they got rebellious. In bitter circumstances. They were in slavery for 400 years. Bitter circumstances. They didn't handle their circumstances 
and allow sweetness to be thrown in there. But the Bible says because of the way God led them, they got discouraged. What makes you think God hadn't led your life in all of those things, those ways that you thought it was just the devil? But God led you through a wilderness to prove you. But you allowed the circumstances you went through the, to call the embitterment circumstance or the bitter circumstances to bring bitterness or root of bitterness in your heart. Now let's look up bitterness. Look up the word bitterness and come and find the meaning. So this is what bitterness means. It comes from the Greek word mar, 4843. And if you look up the root word, it means to trickle. And then the next word that's connected to that after trickle means a distillation. Have you ever seen when they are distilling wine or alcohol and it drips like that? That's the sign of bitterness. Like bitterness is like distillation. And we're going to explain that in a moment. Why the Hebrew words give you an action instead of a meaning. It, it, it describes an action. Where it says uh, bitterness means a, to trickle like a drip to drip. It really comes from the root word. Let me go here. It comes from the root word 4843 Mara. Mara. It means to trickle. And then the root word of Mara is Mar, which means in a sense distillation, a drop like a distilling brewery, brewery. That also connects that people who drink are connected to bitterness. The drink makes them happy. If you notice, drinking is a depressant. And I told you when people are depressed, it's connected to bitterness. But drinking, they use drinking to cover over their bitterness. Do you understand what I'm saying? People who are more prone to drinking, they have a bitter, a bitter stronghold. Or it's, it's that, that, that alcohol is the stronghold that's attacking the bitter, that's covering the bitterness or uh, uh, involved with the whole situation. It's a sign. And cultures that have, are known for big drinking problems, like Russians are known for that. Other cultures are known for Alcohol is strong in the culture. It means they are embittered people. Something happens, happened to make them bitter. They think drinking makes them happy. It's really the opposite. It's because they're trying to be happy because they are bitter in the wrong way. It's a wrong kind of healing mechanism. Do that make sense? So the Hebrew word comes up with distillery or distillation or a drop like winery, like a, like a, um, like a, like a, a, a brew, a brewery. All right. But it means a drop, a trickle. Now this is going to get, this is going to get even deeper because I didn't research this word before I got on with y'all, but I'm doing it now. And I'm showing you how I come up with revelation as I study. So there's another root word, which is mar which come from 47.51, and the other one I read was uh, from 47.52. They are close, but they are different. And so, uh, so 47.51, guess what it means? To be chaved, discontented. So there it is. That's the root of bitterness. You are not content. You are not happy. You are not joyful. Discontented, chave. What do chave mean? Have you ever, have you ever was outside and somebody uh, brushed up against you with a bicycle and it scratched your skin off and it burned, it was burning you? How many of you ever had your skin scratched off and it burned some? Have that ever happened? Wave your hands at me. That's what chave mean. Chave mean means something that has injured you You've gotten shaved. 
it's rubbed you the wrong way. So this is what bitterness, the meaning of bitterness is when something rubs you the wrong way where you become chaved or injured or there's some pain and it burns in anger, it makes your anger burn and you become discontented. That's all bitterness is. Everybody look at bitterness as they stay angry, they just, but no, the root of it comes from a discontentment because you got chaved because something brushed up against you in life the wrong way that you didn't like and you became discontented over that. Lucifer became discontented over bitter envying. His jealousy and envy of man caused him to become chaved and discontent with his position and he wanted something greater. Then he said, I'm going to exalt my throne to God's throne. It won't let you be happy with where God has you. You got to identify that stuff because it's this root that defiles you. It's this root that calls rebellion. God, thank you. I'm so glad I looked up bitterness because I didn't quite do that. How many of you just learned something from that? You got to identify the things that have chaved you, that has brushed up against you, injured you, and rubbed you the wrong way and caused your skin to break. Your skin is broken. There's a little blood coming out and it's burning. And it's made you discontentment discontent and you're angry you're upset about it you are troubled about it that's what it means spring at least the root of bitterness spring up trouble you let's look up bitterness in the greek what do it mean the greek word for bitterness let's see the root meaning in the heat in the new testament where bitterness means that's amazing it's through the idea of piercing sharp pregnant so do you see what that means that's amazing that's a that's amazing. I want y'all to look up that word A C R I D. So the root of bitterness in the New Testament, it also means poison. Bitterness means poison. Say that say that say that having an irritatingly strong and unpleasant taste to the smell. Angry and bitter. That's what acrid means. Acrid. So you are irritated from something unpleasant to your taste or smell that can be in life. That's what bitterness means in the New Testament. There's also a meaning that says poison through the idea of piercing, sharp, pungent. So when people are bitter, they are very sharp with you. This, this is a manifestation. But it also means, in another context, I saw it means poison 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 yeah that's 4088 same thing same a word especially poison so this shows when somebody is bitter it's poison waters poison waters it's poison sharp piercing so I just gave you the root of the root of bitterness I gave you the root of rebellion then I gave you the root of bitterness with these meanings the root of bitterness means to be shaved I gave it to you for something to rub you you in life the wrong way where it brings discontentment to you it makes you unhappy and it troubles you you lose your peace you lose your joy over it that's why it says lift up the hands which hang down at least that which is lame which means correction and all that can make you lame it can also it can it can it wound you but it needs to be healed lift up the hands which hang down Lift up the hands which hang down and make straight paths for your feet. Least that which is lame, that has been wounded in your life, that's caused you to be wounded, be turned out of the way into a root of bitterness. It means give God praise. Stay in the grace of God. Stay in the cherish. Like Paul said, I become a fool in glorying. I glory in my weaknesses. I glory 
at my down times in tribulation. I don't get depressed. I don't allow the devil to bring depression to me because I'm going through tribulation. I don't get offended. I don't go through uh, this spirit of depression uh, and I won't give God no praise uh, uh, and I won't stay in the grace of God, which that's what pray. Stand in the grace of God means stand in the joy, the cherish, or the rejoicing of God. Paul said, I'd rather rejoice in all of these negative moments that the power of Christ may rest on me and the grace may rest. Oh, shakataba dokusha. Glory to God forever. It always goes back to giving God the glory. Keeping your spirit free from poison. You listen to me. If you're the opposite of a praiseful person, you are poison. Your spirit is poison. Your life is poison. It don't matter if you put on a good smile to people and show them that you're happy and all that. In your heart, in your spirit, that's not enough. God looks at you in your heart. What is in your heart? How are you really in the real, real part of you? Hey, let me finish this and then I'm going I'm to go on. This is... This is good stuff. Are y'all learning something? Yes, sir. So here it is. Let me finish. So we all need healing, as the Bible states in this passage. When it says, let it rather be healed, even if the correction is coming from God. That's why the Bible says after he corrects or wounds us, that he will bind us up or heal us. This balance process is needed even when doing surgery or treating a natural wound that has to be closed up and healed or mended back together. But stubbornness, which is idolatry, that has its meaning in the Hebrew means a healer. Which means stubborn people try to heal things or mend things without opening up or wounding first. In other words, they avoid correction. Anything from God that has to correct, rebuke, wound, or challenge that they then avoid and try to cover up without dealing with it. They try to placate and be passive and smooge over things. They want to be a healer while God is wounding, which makes them an idolater, the same offense and sin in the eyes of God as an idol worshiper. Just as he said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft in his eyes, or other words, rebellion offends him just like the offense he gets with witches who work and practice witchcraft. The offense and the smell of this sin in his nostrils is the same offense to him as witchcraft. So to keep from displeasing God by the same offense those who practice witchcraft does, that is through our rebellion, we must deal with the root of bitterness. All rebellion is rooted in bitterness and is an advanced form of disobedience in our lives or mishearing God and having inattention in our lives toward him from distractions. Even though all rebellion is a form of disobedience to God, all disobedience is not a result of rebellion. Disobedience is from mishearing and having an inattention toward him that comes through distractions, while rebellion is different. And it's from bitterness that develops in one's heart because of hard or harsh things or circumstances happening in one's life that causes them pain, bitterness, and anguish of spirit. The word obeying or to obey in the Hebrew means to hear intelligently. We mishear things God tell us because we do not listen with intelligence or with enough intel, knowledge, or wisdom then this means we must get enough wisdom or knowledge to hear or listen to God with intelligence. This means we have to study his word and his ways. Without this, it leads us to being disobedient to him in our lives. So I finished that whole thing there. How many of you learned something today? You got to understand how these spots in your feast of charity affect you, as it says in Jude. You got to understand 
how these very things that you just think is just words in the Bible or this is not happening in your life, how it is happening and it's affecting you. There are reasons why you can't be obedient in areas. There's reasons why there's disobedience and rebellion. And I just broke down everything to its common denominator so that you can learn how to study just like this and study God's word and hear intelligently. I just broke down everything to get an intelligent understanding, a thorough understanding of the root meanings of disobedience, obedience, rebellion, bitterness. That's how you study intelligently. You don't just assume, well, I know what, I know what bitterness means. You don't know it according to how God looks at it. You got to get God's mind about it. Stop believing what you know in the 21st century and study. Study the most simple words you think you already know so that you can understand intelligently what God is really saying. It don't matter if you look like Bozo the Clown or if you look stupid. I'd rather be, uh, uh, while I'm studying every detail of God until I get it right. It's even the pride in our mind that keeps us from studying right because we already think we know words. I know I, I, I think I know what and and or and means, but I still go to the Greek and Hebrew and learn what and and or means in there, how God looks at it. And I get whole different revelations. You got to humble yourself and move the pride of your mind out of the way. That's what high mindedness is. Your mind is already exalted and presumptuous about what you think you already know. And it will make you like, well, I don't need to know that word. I'll look over that one. I don't have to look up bitterness. And that can be the main problem at the root of your problem. How many are learning something? All right, let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word today. I thank you for um, giving me what to teach on today. Because you don't want them to fall by the same sentence and character flaw as Lucifer. He got rebellious because there was bitter envy in him and strife and wars against mankind. God, will you reveal any envy and envy, bitter envy in our lives with any area? Competition instead of completing, competing. God, show the root of all things in the name of Jesus in all of us that are listening and watching anywhere. Give us a spirit of obedience to hear you intelligently. Remove all disobedience and mishearing you and neglecting to hear you the right way. God, we want to live a life of obedience like you. And we want to look at it your way. Obeying is not just doing the right thing. It's being the right person. We want to be obedient. We don't, we, we don't want to do obedience. We want to be it. But we want to have the kind of heart that always hear you intelligently. You said this people do always error in their heart against you. Israel, you told them, they always erred against you in their heart because they wouldn't hear you right. They got rebellious because of the bitterness of the way, the embitterment of their circumstances. How many negative circumstances have happened in our lives and we've allowed that embitterment to, to embitter us, make us bitter. And then we started going astray and rebelling against your will. God, will you heal people's hearts today? Whether they've been through a bitter divorcement that has caused the rebellion to flare up in their life and for them to start disobeying you. God, will you start uprooting the root of rebellion? Lord God, will you, I pray, begin to bring joy back to their life, the joy of the Lord, true joy. They may act like they're joyful, but in their inside they're dead and they're they're not joyful. They're not content at all about nothing they're doing for you or anything. They're just dead. I pray that that would change. I pray 
that you would help them get the true joy and enthusiasm in their heart and in their spirit to do your will. Whatever has come in their life to knock them off their own steadfastness. God, whatever has come in their life that cause a root of bitterness to spring up and trouble them, and now they're becoming unclean and defiled in many different ways you're displeased with. Will you please, I pray for them. Don't let them fail from your grace through bitterness. So in one context, you say we fall from grace through the law to retrieving back to trusting in the law instead of your goodness on the cross and your, your sacrifice. But in Hebrews, we fail from grace by being bitter. God, don't let us fall or fail from your grace. Help us to abide in your grace or the rejoicing or the joyful, cheerful praise truly coming from our heart to you by your goodness and your kindness and your mercy. Let your goodness and kindness be ever before us so it can lead us to repentance from all rebellion, all disobedience in the name of Jesus. Help us to fulfill your will, God. Help us to obey you. In Jesus' name, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for their victory. I pray that they'll overcome the things they're struggling with. Any areas of disobedience to you, any areas of rebellion, any areas of bitterness, stubbornness, idolatry, iniquity, boko, shika, tabakia. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, break every stronghold. Thank you for your word. Your word makes us free. Your word, the entrance of your words giveth light. And your truth shall make us free. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. So Thank much. you right now. In Jesus' name. Well, come on, let's give God the praise for his word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Did y'all learn something today? Yes, sir. You learned. Thank you, How to deal with your roots. Rosh Hashanah is coming up. It's a time of repentance. These messages will help you. you got to deal with the root of what's going on in your life. Where have you been shaved in your life? What bitter experiences have happened that has created the rebellion in your life? Why are you rebelling? We know now because you're bitter. What is your bitterness is your discontentment. That's all it is. It's places where you've been rubbed the wrong way. That you didn't like and made you discontent. And if you come to grips with the truth about yourself and stop covering up being an idolater, covering up acting like you're healing, you're okay about it. That's what Saul did. He covered up like it's okay, but he's bitter. Idolatry. I didn't have time to go through that and give you the Hebrew meaning. But you look up idolatry, it means a healer. That's all it means, a healer. But it could mean nothing good. Couldn't mean the right healer. So it basically means somebody who have the heart to mend, cover some, because healing means to cover and mend and bind some up. It means they want to heal something that ain't even been wounded yet, been dealt with. That's idolatry. That's the true root of idolatry. Idol worshiper. You, God looks at you as an idol worshiper when you're like that. When you don't like correction, when you try to smooth over things, when you don't want to deal with the root of stuff, you are an idolater. God looks at you. You're, that kind of sin and not wanting chastisement and correction from God is idolatry. You're the same you, it's the same offense as an idolater. Do you see how the word of God exposes everything? It's light. It will show you darkness. But you got to study. You will never get these kind of revelations if you don't study. You got to come to grips with your life. What's troubling you? What root of bitterness is springing up trouble you? What things that are discontent in your life? 
And why are you focusing on those things? The only way the bitter waters will become sweet, the solution is the goodness of God leads you to repent from this stuff. Think of God, the kindness and goodness God has done for you in the midst of everything. Stop feeling like you deserve better and know that God has done better to you than what you deserved. When you have that kind of spirit, you are never, you are always blame God. You always blame people. You blame your circumstance. You blame your bad life on everybody. This is the year God is restoring everything, and he wants you to repent of everything, and he wants to turn around everything for you. Because in his presence is where he redeems everything. Even if you've made mistakes, whatever, when you come in his presence, it is the place of redemption. It is the place where he redeems and restores everything, even if you're sick in your body, even if you've been hurt emotionally. And this is another revelation. Some of you are bitter at yourselves for failing. You're bitter at yourself for not missing the mark. That's still wrong. That leads you to rebellion. All rebellion is bitterness in any form. It ain't worth being bitter for no reason, even at yourself. You will never get healed. You will never get whole if you don't stop that. And let's give God thanks for his goodness and his kindness, his sweetness to us. Well, we thank God for another incredible message, a revelation, a deliverance, an impartation was in that for you on many different levels, I know. Every time apostle comes before us, However he chooses to do it, you are under an open heaven, and your life is blessed uh, incredibly tonight. This was another wonderful night with Apostle Taylor. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, they're, they're incredible. And, and this was, a, of course, a recorded message tonight. But every time we hear this, every time you get, it gets into your ears, it is fresh. It is new. It is like fresh bread. It doesn't matter. Uh, because these are eternal words, eternal weight to them. And so there's something new. There's always a new impartation every time. And that was incredible. And, and like you said, uh, that, that message was part of a series. And, you know, we have these series in front of us. And when, when you get a whole box set, a four or five or even a greater uh, uh, collection of volume... There is so much. Apostle goes into so much detail. So we really encourage you to get uh, the warrior, the wedding, the wife, the school, the IBL school, the face-to-face, -face, uh, Prophecy to America, America, whatever it might be, uh, get the complete set. There is just uh, unbounded revelation in them. But you can do all this tonight when you call 877-843-4567 and give to what you heard tonight. Give into it. Seal it. Make it harvest in your life. Make it just come back again and again in your life. And there is a way to give uh, on the, the screen right now. However you need to do it, go ahead and get that in the ground. So coming up are all these different ways to give. And I just gave the uh, text to give. And of course, you can cash app uh, uh, to cash app and then, of course, debit card, credit card. You can go online to koggc.org uh, and give uh, directly that way, uh, however you want to do it. But if, uh, if you're just more comfortable just to call in, 877-843-4567, there's a prayer warrior that can walk you through it, Pastor Ashley. Yes, lots of different ways to give. Whatever way is convenient for you, Apostle has it. And there's PayPal as well online. So there's many different options. Um, they'll put the address up there as well if you want to mail it in. Um, but whatever way works for you, the texting and the cash app are the quickest, of course, and then the website will give you more options. And Apostle mentioned when he was, you know, communicating about, um, you know, sowing tonight, I loved when he said, um, miracles of acceleration 
acceleration um, or accelerated miracles. And so that is your promise tonight, that apostle spoke over your offering when you sow in tonight. And, um, you know, I know I'm sowing in tonight because that is a powerful word. And uh, when apostle blesses offerings and um, blesses what you sow in, um, those blessings always come to pass. And so make sure to sow in tonight. And if you call in to sow, uh, a minister will be able to pray with you that prayer of agreement as well. That is a very good point. And uh, yeah, uh, accelerated harvest, accelerate your seed. Go ahead and get that into the ground now. You can do it. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. In fact, by then you may talk yourself out of it. Uh, You might forget. Uh, Just go ahead and do that now. Bless Apostle Taylor. Bless him uh, you know, for the arenas coming up, that the arenas will be paid for. Just bless him tonight. Bless the man of God in that shut away. And uh, that face-to-face prophet's reward will be yours as you bless him. While he's in shut away, this is a secret time. It's a time that he is away with God in secret. And so while you sow to him, in secret, you sold to the Lord uh, in secret, you're going to be uh, blessed. Your life is going to harvest in the open, even as surely as when he comes out of this secret shut away, that uh, his life will be uh, blessed. Uh, the arenas are going to be just incredible. The weight of glory is just being constructed incredible. Uh, but you can be a part of that right now by giving uh, in at this time. Yes, and Apostle mentioned, you know, when he was um, communicating about the offering as well, he communicate, he was talking about the $400 million vision that he is in right now. And he originally was in a $70 million vision, but the Lord came to him and told him that his vision was too small and that he was actually in a $400 million vision. And so everything that he is in the midst of doing is directly commanded to him from the Lord. And so when he kicks off this um, arena tour, Um, you know, starting in Orlando, you know, that's only the beginning because the Lord has commanded him to actually build his own 100,000 seat arena um, that he is in the works of. And so that is a big part of what your donations will be going to because of the mission uh, to save America, uh, which is very important. And we're all very much involved, um, you know, for that, no matter where you are, if the Lord has connected you here, um, you know, he has a place for you in that. And uh, let your night be blessed in Jesus' name. the glory and the honor. Lift those hands, saints, tell them. We lift our hands in words. Tell the wonderful Lord as we praise your holy name. Tell Jesus you deserve the glory. A wonderful master. Lord, we live, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we pray. Everywhere, lift those hands. You are great. He loves when you tell him. Miracles are there is no one else like you, and there is no one else like you. For you are great, you do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. Everywhere, Lord, and there. There is no one else like you. And there is no one else 
victorious. You do miracles. There is no one. And there is no one else like you. Altísimo in Spanish. Mi gras oso salvado. No hay nadie como tú I know I not como tú Altísimo Mi brazo so salvador No hay nadie como tú I know I'm not a poor mortal. I'll tease him all. Make us Tell Jesus, I know I'm not a Expect your miracle tonight. Lift those hands and expect your miracle. From the God of miracles. No, I got it. You go.